Hi guys, and welcome back to another episode of Frozen Fortunes, the analysis days. Anyway, we're going to get into things straight away with this one. Of course, if you do like these videos, do drop a like on them to let me know if you want to hear me keep doing them. So we're going to jump straight into the team stats. We've obviously got the player stats, and then we'll do our usual analysis, see if we can find any things that are interesting. And I think this year might be one of those years where we do because of the tactical changes. And I think it's quite important for me to sort of play off players against each other, particularly players I've been rotating around, like your Santoses and your Mateus Hansen, also to see which one of our strikers have been performing best in their roles. Centre-backs have been fairly solid for most of the season, though. Anyway, let's get into things. Average possession, my lordy, would you look at that? We're not bottom of the average possession possession charts and remember we played the first half of the season basically like an entire half of the season with that old tactic so we've really brought ourselves up and i think next year i'd be very surprised if we're not number two uh for possession next year because of the way we generally go penalties taken uh we've taken six we've only scored four this year mariano bravo has missed a couple uh which is unfortunate but it's just how things go headers one we're right up there as well with silk which is nice to see headers one ratio still pretty high up though with 65 percent so we're winning a lot of headers and we're also winning a lot of headers as a percentage too which is promising for us really and i think that's a sign that our defenders are definitely doing doing more work this year uh yellow cards still very very high but again the first half of the season kind of contributes to that how in the hell did lingby get five red cards this year my god dirty bunch uh we're down there with one i think that was the juan shizzy one where he got a second yellow um odense and Orbog didn't get any as well which is really damn impressive for them Form, not really relevant whatsoever. Oh my god, look at the attacking. Goals, 83 goals scored in the league. I think that's actually a league record as well. The most ever scored in the top flight in Denmark, according to the uh, thing that popped up, I think. I don't know, actually. Yeah, I feel, it feels like that should be a record. Uh, Midland, not that far behind. Uh, neither were Copenhagen or Norgeland, really. All four of those sides really smashing the goals in. Uh, cross completed, 18%. Top of the league for crosses completed. That's what I like to see. It's nice to see us excelling at some of these stats. To me, that really shows that we are improving massively as a squad when we're excelling in these kind of areas. Crosses completed overall, 235. Like, that's 40 more crosses than Bromby. Uh, if you could 40 less than Bromby, it would bring you all the way down to sort of here with Suniusk and teams like that. We are the kings of the cross. Goals from corners. 11 goals we've scored from corners this season. We're the kings of set pieces as well, apparently. Uh, that's, that's a huge number of goals. 11 goals from corners. There's like eight, no. That's like 12, 15% of our goals this year have come from set pieces. Just giving us that extra level of goals that have helped us win a lot of games. Goals and direct free kicks. Been a few more this season. We did score one. Santos got that one against Bromby, which definitely helped. Goals from indirect free kicks. Uh, just the two. Copenhagen pretty high on that one. Pass completion ratio. Now, not as low as it would have been. If this was last season, we'd have been dead last on this, down towards the 60s. But because of the way we're playing, it's all the way up to 73. And again, I expect us to be close to the top two or three teams again next year when a full season with this new tactic that's what i expect anyway passes completed we've got ourselves all the way up to fifth in that again despite playing half the season like that it's going to take us a long way to catch up with the likes of copenhagen but you just never know chances created 200 chances created in the league Midtjylland really they created a lot of opportunities um so it's surprising to me that they ended up coming sixth they obviously weren't clinical enough to put their chances away and it does understand why Odense perhaps did get relegated. They were one of the fewest chances created in the entire league. Shots on target ratio is very, very high, but it's not noticeably high. Uh, it's not like 3 or 4% higher than everyone else. It's right in there at the top with the Lingbys and the Midgetlands and the AGF. So maybe that's a little bit to look, to look at. Uh, maybe there's a striker that's not hitting the target as much as they used to. Shots on target. Again, Midgetland. 255 shots on target this season i think they've been they've severely underperformed based on what this i feel like their expected goals god i wish that was a stat in fm i wish you could actually see the expected goals um that'd be such a nice thing to be able to look at for some of these analyses 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 um i feel like they should have finished higher than they have really um it seems to me like obviously this is just one aspect of it but they're getting a lot of chances and a lot of shots on target and they've just not taken their chances, it seems like. We're up there. Copenhagen are up there. Norgeland are up there. That's basically the top three, I think. Although, Orberg are a little bit lower. Bromby, again, a little bit lower. But Odense, right down at the bottom. Maybe there's a reason why they got relegated. Fouls against... Um, wow, we did not... My goodness, we did not draw a lot of fouls this season. That is surprising. Uh, dribbles per game. Uh, we're sort of around the middle of that. 17 per game. I think once we get to a point where we've got slightly better dribblers in the team, this will make sense. But... I guess because they often use wingers. Um, wingers are generally the players with the best dribbling. So I, I guess that makes sense because we don't really play with any wingers. Ronda's right down at the bottom on that one. Conceded. They conceded 24 goals this year. There's a reason why their goal difference was so good and that is it. But look at us. Sixth overall. 55 goals conceded this season. That is so much better than it has been in previous years. We've got a positive goal difference by comfortable margin. 
And really, we're only a few goals away from having the third best defense in the league. At one point, I think it said we were fourth best overall, but a few little goals conceded here and there have just kind of taken us down a, a peg or two on that one. I think next year, the target is going to have to be, again, top scorers in the league. That's obviously the target. But I want to be the number two goals conceded next year because I don't see us catching Copenhagen anytime soon. They are head and shoulders above the rest on that one. Conceded from corners. Um, seven. Seven goals conceded from corners this year. Defending set pieces has probably cost us a little bit this year. We'll have a little look at that one um, as well. Conceded from direct free kicks. One. So that's eight from set pieces. And indirect free kicks, two. So we've conceded 10 goals from set pieces this year. Not ideal. I feel like we've had better seasons, but I think it's still an improvement on last year. Uh, I actually don't remember. If you do remember what, how many we've conceded from set pieces last year, do let me know in the comments. I'll be very, very interested in that one. Something to potentially work on, but I, I don't think it's the, the be all and end all right now. But it did nearly cost us against Bromby in that final game of the season. Clean sheets. Um, to be fair, we've had nine clean sheets. I think we only got one clean sheet in the entire top flight season last year. So to have eight more than last year, I mean, can't really fault that. Um... Randers, not a single clean sheet all season. And somehow it looks like they're probably going to stay in this league. That is just shameful. Um, fouls made, not as high as we used to be. We've, we've brought it down a little bit. I feel like we've simmered off a tiny little bit on the number of fouls. We would be right up here, probably over 500 most seasons. But second half of the year, again, the new style of tactic. With us keeping the ball more, we haven't had to commit so many fouls to win the ball back. That being said, tackles won. The most tackles won in the entire league with 969. Uh, comfortably more than anyone. Look at Midgeland. We've won 369 or so more tackles than them. That is shocking to see how many tackles they've not won this season. So I'm guessing with Midgeland, it's a case of they created a lot of chances, but were so bad at defending, they just weren't getting their tackles in. Uh, tackles one ratio. We're right up there, but not quite as high as I would have liked. I want to see us pushing that towards 80, but we will see. Um, Randers right up there on the tackles. So are Odense. Silkeborg very, very low. Penalties conceded. Uh, three penalties Holy Christ, Odense conceded 10 penalties this season. That is, that, is, that is ridiculous. Guys, keep it in your pants. Like That is an absurd amount of penalties to concede in one season. Attendances, uh, obviously the lowest with an average of 1,847, but that's still massively improved, I believe, over last season. And I'm hoping as we continue to improve, that will start to catch up and eventually we won't be bottom. Um... But yeah, I still haven't heard about what you guys have said about the idea of changing the stadium name and what you want to change it to. But hopefully we can get a chance to, to fill it maybe once in the league. That's what I would like from the save, to fill the stadium in the league once. Average capacity, obviously going to be massively low. Stadium sellouts, obviously going to be nowhere near that. Highest attendance, we had 2,739 in the stadium for one game. So I guess that's something. Um, lowest attendance was 1,000. Uh, comfortably the lowest in the entire league. Now this is an interesting one. Net transfer spend this season. Copenhagen spent £4.2 million this year, and they've won the league. Esbjerg and Randers both spent money and really, really struggled. Midtjylland actually made £6.8 million this season, and we made £2.34 million on our transfer. So we're still on a net positive, and that's what I'd really like to see. Salary per annum, uh, still the lowest salary in the league by a comfortable margin. Um, but not as comfortable as it has been in previous years. It's up to 1.62 million. The professional status, I think, has made a huge difference on that one. Um, but still, we've come second in the in this league with the lowest salary in the league. You know, the teams around us that we finished near. Midgeland, their salary is what? Four times ours. Norgeland, four times. Orborg, roughly four times. Bromby, more like five times us. So we're still massively punching above our weight. And still nowhere near the amount. I mean, Copenhagen are outspending everyone by four times, even their nearest opponents. Um, but hey, we're one of the few teams in this league who have got secure finances. Us and Copenhagen, basically. That's all it is. Everyone else is either okay, and there's a few sides that are insecure, particularly Bromby. Keep an eye on them. Maybe some financial difficulties in the future. Anyway, I'm going to have a sip of my drink. Apologies that I have to do this um, and I can't edit it out. It's just because it takes so long to edit these videos that to try and find every little one of these, it's just, it's just a pain in the ass. And I just want to get the video done because there's a lot of information to get through. Anyway, player details. So appearances is totally irrelevant. Games won. Ah, okay. It's actually nice to see that Moskutsa and Bravo have won a lot of games, but then so have a lot of people. It's really hard to say. This one, we shouldn't have any players anywhere near it. Yep. Uh, yellow cards. We should have a few players on here, I would expect. Moskutsa and Rogers Jr., of course, are up there. And Shishi. Okay. To be fair, we got two of those in the same game. Uh, red cards. Well, we've only had one, which was Juan Shishi. Wow. Jens Stagia got two red cards this season. Calm down, Jens. Player of the Match Awards. We should be up there with a few of these. Ursan got seven, but David Taubleib is right up there as well. Svenningson and Brava got five each. Do we have any more on this list? No, we don't. Let's have a little look while we're here at David Taubleib. Whoa, he's American. Holy crap. Oh my God. He's American. 
that we could have signed this guy then. He's come from New York City. How much did they pay for him? He's a free transfer from New York City. He's the kind of player that we could have got on one of our amateur free contracts things. Genuinely, this is the kind of guy who's now the top scorer or one of the top players in this division. Um, no caps for America, though. That's a bit surprising. Then again, look at his wages. That is stupidly high. I think the highest wa rage waged player we've got is on less than half of that. He's still only a rotation option. Crazy. 48 goals for them already. He got 17 in 27 and then got even better this year. Look at the assists. My God, he's a monster. Anyway, moving along, distance covered. Mikkel Juland, interestingly, was the highest amount of distance covered. Um, presumably not in that game when we played against them because he was in our pockets in that one. While Scoots and Rogers Jr. are right in there, nobody else is likely to be in there. Distance covered per 90 minutes. Again, Michelin really putting themselves about. Moskuts has fallen off. He always wins this one. Shishi's getting even more in there. And Rogers Jr. just a little bit off the pace. Shows you how what a job Shishi does in that midfielder, the way that he gets around. Average ratings, we should have loads of players on here. Ursan's top. Bravo's second. Moskuts is fourth. Svenningsen down in tenth there. Um, so still right in there. Shishi down in 15th. Rogers Jr. is on there as well. That's no defenders, but then... You know, they've only sort of come into their own in the second half of the season. Headers won. Go on, let's have some lads on here. Christian Laver wins 207 headers, and uh, that's apparently it. Oh, that's a shame. Um, goals. I mean, look at this. Bravo, 26. Talbleve, 26. Ursan, 25. Berg's dropped off a tiny bit. Look at the, the amount of players that have scored more than, 10 go uh, more than 20 goals in the league this year in this division. is astonishing. Eight different players got to the 20 mark. That's astonishingly high. Svenningsen got 14 uh, in the league in 19 appearances from the start. That's still pretty good. Bravo started 28 games and scored 26 goals. Ursan, 25 in 26. So Svenningsen is still a little bit off the pace there, but he has made a lot more substitute appearances. So I'd be interested to see what his goals to minutes ratio actually lines up like. That's kind of more important to me. Anyone else in there, not a chance. Average minutes per goal. Here we go. So Svenningsen, 117. So it is still actually lower than the rest of them. Um, Ursan is scoring on average a, a goal a game, basically, in terms of minutes. Every 90 minutes, he scores a goal, and Bravo is just in behind that. Then it's quite a drop-off to Taubelieb and Elisi, uh, and then Svenningsen with every 117 minutes. So, sort of every game and a half, Svenningsen's getting himself a goal, which is still bloody excellent. Um, it's not even a game and a half, a game and a quarter. Still bloody excellent for a 17-year-old to be doing that kind of thing. You don't see any other 17-year-olds or any other teenagers on this list at all. Uh, per Nielsen for Lingby is the closest one, and he is nowhere near uh, to the level of Jonas Fenningsen. So still, if we can hang on to him this summer, which I really, really hope we can, then I think next year could be a breakout season for him next year. And we'll, we'll see. I mean, it, it really is going to be interesting to see who lines up as our first choice strike partnership next season when you've got three strikers that are capable of scoring all these goals. I mean, look at this. 25 goals, 26 goals, and 14 goals. So 51, 65 goals these three have scored between them this season in the league. That's astonishing. 65 goals out of... So only... What? Only 18 goals this year were scored by players that weren't those three. That's stunning. Shots. Talbley right up there. Um, Bravo hasn't had as many shots as some of those guys. Shishi's had a lot of shots, uh, but only scored four goals. So maybe cool it, Juan. Um, Ursan and uh, Svenningsen in there as well. Shots on target. Bravo. Ursan. Svenningsen. Um, shots on target percentage. Wow. Okay. Look at that. Bergman for Randers. And... Uh, uh, hmm, uh, that name there. Uh, Guthmunda Andre Trigevassen. Guthmunda, yeah, Guthmunda Andre Trigevassen. I think that's how I pronounced it. Anyway, um, yeah, he's got a damn good one as well. But still, Bravo up there with 60, Ursan 59. Ah, okay. Svenningsen all the way down on 48. This is a thing. Bravo and Ursan are hitting that target way more. Than, not way more, but like a noticeable amount more than Jonas Svenningsen. And I do wonder why that is. We'll have to have a look at that when we get into the proper player stats, because that, I think, is the reason that Svenningsen has kind of come in and out of himself this year. He has some great games, but then he also has some really poor ones, and I think it's from him not hitting the target enough. I think if he'd hit the target the same percentage as these guys, his goals would be around about the same level as them. Team goals. Mariano Bravo has been on the pitch for 82 of our 83 team goals. Wow! That's actually really interesting. So he's been in the team for all but one of the goals that we've scored this season. Does that mean he's on the pitch for it, or just that he's in the team? That's very, very interesting. If someone could actually clarify, does that mean he was on the pitch when the goal was scored, or does it mean that he was at, on the pitch at some point during the game in which the goal was scored? Uh, Moskutz at 82, Lever 77, Svenningsen 76, interestingly, Ursan right down on 75. So, bravo. If that is true, it really does show what an important impact he has on this team. Penalties. Rivaldinho, uh, bravo got three out of five penalties this year. Not as good as his... Uh, 
100% record from last season, but we'll, 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 we'll let him slide. Assists. Edison Flores with 13. Bravo and Ursan got 10, goal, uh, 10 assists each as well. Svenningsen in there with 8. So, again, still pretty damn good from the lad, despite not playing as much. Key passes. 78 key passes for Muscoot. So, Rogers Jr. with 60. Ursan 51. Svenningsen 51. Bravo 51. So, Svenningsen, again, you can see this, though. Less game time, same number of key passes as his teammates. So, he's clearly more of a passer. And I think, given more time, would have got more assists. Chances created. Ursan, 32 chances created. 27. Muscoot's to 24. Um, interesting that Svenningsen isn't on this list at all. So, a lot of key passes, but his key passes aren't creating as many chances, perhaps. Pass completion. Go on, let's have someone on here. Sergio Santos, 84% pass completion. Uh, I assume no Matthias Hansen, although that might because he hasn't played enough games. Crosses completed. Here we go. Uh, oh, oh, oh dear. Santos, 22. Shishi, 22. Ursan, 21. Bravo, 21. Something to perhaps have a little look at. Although, again, the slight change to the tactic could have completed. But look at this. Kuzgen Diniev, 40% crosses completed. Oh, he's a deep line playmaker. He's not really a winger. Um, like, if we could find a wing back that's got an absurd level of crosses completed, I would be very, very happy. Hulmon, that's not the guy we're looking at, though, is it? No. Uh, I'd be interested to know what the cross completion is of those players we were looking at, though. Um, because if they can do any better, then I'll be very, very open to that. Average minutes per goal. We already saw that, of course. Ursan's right up there. Shots overall. Uh, wait, that's that's me, isn't it? We've already done all that, haven't we? Uh, let's see. Uh, dribbles per game. Crosses completed. Right, here we go. Dribbles per game. Anyone up there? Svenningsen. There you go. A new object, a new attribute for us to exploit. Ursan clearly hasn't got the dribbling ability of Jonas Svenningsen. I think he's got like 12 dribbling. It might even be more than that. 15 dribbling. Yeah. Um, no wonder he's able to go past people. My lord, what a player. Um, offsides. Bravo does get offside quite a lot. Ursan up there as well, as is Sveni. Team conceded. Curtin has been on the pitch for 29 goals. Canate. Wow, Curtin really does seem to be a valuable player for us. Tackles per game. Any players on here? Rogers Jr. and Muscuza, of course. Any more? No. Mistakes into goal. I feel like we're going to have a couple on this list. Uh, wow, we actually don't. Hey, I'm happy with that. Mistakes. Julian's made a lot of mistakes, as have both of these two, but they always will in that position, unfortunately. Shishi's made a few as well. It's a shame, but there you go. There you go. Alejandro Perez, on loan from Reading, makes the most key tackles of any player in the division this year. Maybe he's a player we could try and look at getting back again uh, in the summer, because... I think because of our 50% clause, we might actually be able to get 50% off of the transfer in so doing. I don't know if that still works, but we might actually be able to get some money back on him if we try and bring him back into the club. Um, I mean, would that really be worth it? I mean, he's got some bloody good stats. Heading, marking, tackling. He's tall. He's got a lot of good ability. He's worth a decent chunk of change, though. Um, which is good in both ways, because if we were to be able to sign him back, that would be pretty damn cool. But also... If he's worth a lot of money now and he does actually seem to be playing well, the chances of him playing well for Reading get better, which means we could get a lot of money for him down the line as a result of the clause we've got him. Interesting one to have a look at, perhaps. Um, but it definitely shows that 20 years old, he is head and shoulders. Like, Lever can't even come near to him, really. 41 key tackles this season. Lever has still made a decent number, which I'm proud of him for. Key headers. Anyone else up here for us? Uh, we're sort of there. Moskutsa and Lever. Rogers Jr. not on there, interestingly. Interceptions made. I would expect to see Pat Curtin fairly high on this one. Yeah, 144. Lever's made a decent number as well. Less to be said for Claudio Rivera, but there you go. Headers one ratio. Anyone on there? 90%. 87. 82. Very, very nice. Would like to see a few more again on there as well. Shots blocked, 10 each for those two. Rivera not showing up on here, interestingly. Maybe he has been a bit poor. Maybe he's not been as good. Conceded this season. Canate, 34 goals conceded this year overall. Um, which means that I must have played someone else at some point. Was it Ustergaard that played a lot of games for us earlier this season? Um, but it's more like conceded per 90 minutes. It's still... Yeah, see, like, Kupic is better. Uh, although, I've got to say, he's clearly made a difference to us between the sheets. Between the sheets? He's made a hell of a difference to us between the sheets, ladies. Um, clean sheets, obviously, Kanate is going to be right up there as well uh, with seven clean sheets. Ustagor managed to get three, to be fair to him. So, not too bad. Saves held. Canate up there with 37, and saves parried. Not really a relevant stat. So, let's move over to the actual analysis and do a little bit of that as well. Um, I'm just going to keep talking while I do it because otherwise I will forget to edit it out and then you'll just have randomness of me saying all kinds of stuff. The squad isn't even loading properly. Right, so uh, that's my squad view. Let's go to... Well, we'll start with the goalkeepers. Custom 
Uh, goalkeeper analysis, right. So, filters, senior squad. We'll leave them all on for now. Also, I'm going to have a little drink while I do this. We only want central goalkeepers. None of them left-sided bastards. Right. Um, most of God's out on loan, which is annoying, so we can't really compare how they did. But we can still have a little look at what Canate's done. Uh, maybe have a little look at himself. So, team goals per 90 minutes. Team conceded 1.24. Saves how? I mean, points per game. He's two points a game with him in the team. It's pretty damn solid. Let's just take a little look at his actual stats while we're here. He's determined. He's got a contract for four years yet. He's wanted by uh, 26 clubs. So, yeah. Um, some quite big sides in there. Leon for one of them. Minor interest from some other sides as well. Mostly England, France, Germany, and occasionally a little bit of cheeky Portugal in there as well. I've got an asking price on him at a set of 7.5 million at the moment because I want to try and deter them and because my assistant told me to put it up a little bit more. If someone offers me 7.5 million for this guy and I can negotiate back in a two-year loan period with all my extra clauses, I'd probably be tempted, to be honest, because that would be a lot of money for us that could save us for years. Um... And give us a chance. But then again, he is... Mm, I don't know. I, I, if someone gave me 7.5 minutes, I probably would sell. But only with those other things completed in the meantime. Anyway, that's goalkeepers. There's nothing we can really say about goalkeepers because of the way things have gone. Let's move straight over to the wingbacks. Although, I want to compare them with each other more than I want to compare them with other players. Because there really haven't been a lot of other players. So it's defensive midfielders, left and right sided. There we go. Although we can compare them with Ed Strick, kind of. Although, he's the only one that's actually played this year other than these two. Uh, so... Let's just see. Appearances, not really that important. Points per game. So we've won a few more points. I mean, look at this. Points per game with Ed Strick and the team, 0.85. Okay, he only made seven appearances for us this season, but that definitely shows you there's something about these wingbacks being very, very integral to this team. Won a few more points with Moskutsa in the team, but only negligible, but it does show how important they are. Uh, team conceded per 90 minutes. Again, around about 1.34, and then Ed Strick, it's literally double that with him in the team. I'm sorry, Eddie, baby, but you're clearly not quite up to this one, are you? Uh, tackles one ratio is so much lower. Muscuta massively wins that, but Rogers Jr., slightly better on the old passing. But then again, Moskutsa actually makes more key passes, so Rogers Jr. completes more passes, but um, Moskutsa is better at picking out those really gemmy, lovely passes. Better at the interceptions, although Rogers wins more headers. Headers one per 90 minutes is roughly the same. Games one, relatively similar. Moskutsa dribbles a little bit more. He also gets about a little bit more, but his cross completion is worse. He's created more chances um, per 90 minutes and has more assists this year. Don't exactly know how many assists he actually has. If there's a way to find that out, we'll just quickly check now. So this season, he's got four assists. Well, um, this doesn't take into account. No, it doesn't. So he's got 14 assists this season in all competitions, if you include the Cup and the League and the Europa League. So 14 is bloody good in all competitions. Rogers Jr., on the other hand, has got three. So, I mean, that d genuinely shows you the, the difference between Moskutsa and Rogers Jr. Uh, Rogers Jr., slightly better defensive player, I would say. Um, perhaps just sort of keeps the pace going. But that could also be because of the player he's got on his side. He has to do a lot more work because Shishi's constantly going up the pitch. Rogers Jr. as well still has no cap on his potential. He's still got more to go. So, you know, there, there is also that option. He's wanted by Hamburg. Doesn't get a lot of assists, though. It's really worth pointing that out. He's got three assists in the league, and that's literally it. Uh, whereas Moskutz have 14 assists this season. No wonder he's played so well and getting that average rating up so much higher than him. Uh, he's also made no mistakes leading to goals. So there's also that. Mistakes are relatively similar. So what's causing that to be the case? Slightly better tackling. Everything here is dead sent. His crossing is slightly worse, which does bear out, although that's quite a large drop-off considering. Slightly better stamina. His acceleration is the same. His work rate is a teensy bit higher. Like, considering the number of assists he's got, you'd feel like there's something about him that is causing this to be the case. Positioning's worse. Off the ball's worse. Determination is slightly higher. Decisions is, is lower. Concentration is lower. So why is he getting so many more assists? To me, it, at this point, it kind of has to be down to the fact that... There's something about uh, the, 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 the wing he plays on that's probably causing that. Let's just take a little look at the attributes. We can properly compare them. Anywhere that Roger maybe Muscuta is massively better. So free kick's better, long shot's better. Nothing hugely important there. Um, his tackling is a tiny bit better. He's a lot braver. Determination, fair, leadership, work rate. Nothing stands out. Like The only way he's massively braver. That's the only thing I can think of. That he is massively braver than Rogers Jr. But I don't think that would account for 14 assists. It just seems a bit strange, that one. I think that's more down to the position on the team he's actually playing in terms of who's in front of him and who's around him. It's the only thing I can think of to cause that. Because Moskutsa has had an excellent season and has, generally speaking, always put in slightly better performances. Uh, Moskutsa, again, higher rating as well. Potential's right there. He's a resolute personality as well. 
Um, but he's just never caught, quite got to grips with this wingback role. Like, he's he just never really grown that much in the crossing and dribbling. So, I don't know. We'll have to see how we go with that one. He's had a quality season. And he scored a goal as well, which is really, really nice. His performance is in the cup as well. 8.21, or 1-2 rather. It's pretty damn good. Anyway, let's move on to the centre-backs because, you know, nothing really to say about Ed Strick at this point. Just going to have another sip of my drink while we do that. Centre-backs. Uh, defenders. Central. Right. We have had a few that have played this year. So let's just sort our minutes to see who we want to talk about. Um, Under-19 squad. Right, that doesn't make any difference. And that only really includes Coutinho, who's a midfielder anyway. So, we've got Christian Laver, who's played a lot of minutes, Rivera, and Curtin. And they've played relatively similar amounts of minutes for them, to be fair. Safety's played a few times. Augustine's played a few times. Massimiliano Rocco, who I really do want to give a contract to. Um, I kind of feel like with he's got that potential, fairly professional personality, he's improving and he's wanted by Sulius. Uh, okay, new contract. How much does he want? Oh, well, I mean... We can do that. 110 pound a week. Um, right, what I'm going to do is I'm actually what I do is I remove all of this nonsense. Um, I'd rather give them more money up front than deal with this nonsense down the line. We also like to put in a lovely optional contract extension. Lovely old job. And then I'll dump this up to like 200. And that usually does the trick. There you go. So 200 pound a week, contract for 5 years and another 3 years after that. You know, it just gives us a bit of um I don't know, security on him. I, I think for £200 a week, it's worth getting him in on a full contract because he's got that five-star potential and I, I kind of think that with the players around us, it might be worth just giving him that contract. Right, sorry I had to do this during this uh, video, but I didn't want to forget. And there's also Thomas Vasek, who is a young Czech lad who I brought in who, I don't know, like I felt like for £160 a week, it was worth bringing him in just because we could loan him out to some sides and maybe sell him on later. He was on a free after all. Uh, right, anyway, let's actually take a look at this. So team conceded per 90 minutes. Augustine, massively high. Laver up there. Rivera and Curtin, particularly Pat Curtin. He has really been so, so integral to this team. When he plays, we don't concede that many goals, just in general. That seems to be the, the, the way things have gone. The other players are slightly more interchangeable, although Rivera has been pretty damn good as well. Uh, but Pat Curtin clearly is the most important defender for us at this exact moment. Tackles per game. It's, they're all relatively in there, although Rocco's a little bit lower, but hey. Tackles one ratio. This is kind of what I'm more interested in. Curtin, 88%. Um, whereas Rivera and Leiva are down in sort of, sort of I mean he's got 10% more tackles completed than them uh, which is interesting because Augustine's usually the player that played there and he's sort of out Augustine in Augustine so that, that's good to see I'm happy with that points per game okay quite an important one now Curtin again massively up top but they're in there as well the other players we've just cons we've you know just scored less points per game with them in the team not dramatically less uh, than Curtin but again you can see how important he is to us doing well Less goals conceded per 90 minutes, more points per game when he's in the team. I bet his win percentage is probably fairly high as well. Although I don't know if I've got that stat turned on for these guys. So, so there you go. Um, passes completed. Rivera, 70. Lever 70. Pat Curtin with a few less passes completed, but it's all round about the same area. It's good to see that Rocco's completed a fair number of them. Mistakes. Um, Lever makes a lot of mistakes, whereas Rivera and Curtin do not. That's one area, actually, um, where Christian Lever clearly is a bit of a... He's got a bit, a bit of that in him. Where's that coming from? Uh, is that his composure, perhaps? Or his first touch? Or his passing? I don't know. Is there some area that really stands out as being poor? Finishing, long shots, penalty taking, flair, mm, vision? I don't know. I wonder why he's making more mistakes. Maybe it's just because he has to play next to Carl Rogers Jr. Maybe that's what's doing it. Um, mistakes into goals. Leave it again with one of those. Key tackles. Um... I'm guessing, yeah, Lever right up there as well. So he, he's one of those players. He's a bit fiery in the sense that he's a good player, but he will... When he's good, he's very good. But when he's bad, he sometimes has a worse game than a more consistent player. I think he's a bit inconsistent. But when he's good, he's very, very good. I look at the key headers as well. It's, it's noticeably more than anyone else. Key passes per 90 minutes as well um, is more for... Much more for Levo. In fact, it's more than double Pat Curtin. Interceptions per 90 minutes, though. But again, Pat Curtin just out Augustine's Augustine. Six interceptions per game is so much higher than the players around him. Of course, he plays in a different role. So that makes sense. Headers one ratio. Here we go. Lever 83. Um, Pat Curtin 75 and Rivera 72. Now then, why is that? Is his heading poor? No, 13 heading, 16 heading, 14 heading. Uh, is he shorter than the others? Six foot one, six foot two, six foot. Hmm. 
strength perhaps is that an issue for him I, I i really don't know 14 strength is strange but again it could come down to the side he's playing on maybe he's relying a little bit too much on fabian moscusa certainly noteworthy though headers per 90 minutes curtain right up there laver rivera again few less though he does seem to be struggling in the air against players win percentage curtain 69 rivera 69 laver a tiny little bit less we do seem to win more with him out him in the team and uh, actually rocco potentially making a charge there as well why is rivera not winning so many headers what is that about him it's interesting. Flair's very low. Heading 13. Jumping reach 10. Hmm. An interesting one, to say the least. Any ideas? Put them in the comments. I'd be very interested to hear that. Ability-wise, um, Laver's clearly the best. The rest are kind of just battling it out. Safey's potential is just kind of seem a bit capped there. But Rocco, I feel like there's a chance for him to make a step up next season. And maybe our sort of second... He could potentially be the sub center back the guy we have on the bench to bring on in games when we need to rest players and stuff i think massimiliano rocco could be that guy next season for us particularly if he signs a new contract for us um because i just don't want teams being interested in him right now i'd rather if they are going to be interested in him i'd rather them have to pay us for his services you know um average rating overall interesting that Lever actually has the highest average rating overall and curtain has the lowest despite his contributions being there for all to see um also notice how little they're worth Laver's worth 25, 20k, Curtin 3,000, and Rivera 3,000. I think that could come down to their wages. I mean, Laver's on a decent amount. No, he's not. He's on 750 quid. Uh, he's not on a lot of money. Curtin is on 750 quid, and I think Rivera's also on 750 quid. We're paying our centre-backs the bare minimum wage for them to be able to play. I sense during the summer, these three are all going to end up on new contracts because teams are going to come in for them, most likely, and they're going to want new contracts if they're going to stay. And I'll probably put them on them anyway. So that's where some of our wage budget is going to go. So it's all we're trying to sign players, but we need to make sure that we keep the players we currently have because I think they're very, very important to the way we play. Anyway, let's move into the midfield and take a little look at what's going on in there. So, uh, whoops, Daisy. Oh, God's sake, come on. Midfield analysis. Right, let's get these midfielders up. Midfielders, central, lovely old job. Is there anyone I'm missing on here that will come back when we... Meet it's not really that important. Coutinho and Sugard. Oh, Sugard's actually counting as a senior squad now. So, minutes this season from the midfield. Shishi, of course. Santos, Morley, Kowalczyk, Hansen, Lund, and of course, uh, Tonya Harding there. All getting a reasonable number of minutes. Sugard, not quite so much. I wish this thing here would take into account the Europa League as well and the Cup. For some reason, it doesn't seem to do that, does it? It seems to only talk about the league, and I don't know why. It makes no sense that you would only want to see the league stats. Why can't we see the stats from all competitions? Uh, is there a way of doing that? I I'm very interested now. Stats. Competitions. Overall. So how do we get this up? But with those other stats. If you, let, if you know the answer to that question, then do let me know. I'll be very interested to hear it. Because that, that does bug me quite somewhat. Anyway, midfielder analysis. So let's get into this. Assists per 90 minutes. Tony with the most, but not played enough for me to consider that statistically relevant. Shishi has more assists than... Well, he's got the same number of assists as both of our attacking playmakers put together. Now, it's obviously going to be a bit skewed this season because of the way that the tactics have changed mid-season. So things aren't quite lining up the way they would maybe have you'd expected them to uh, if I hadn't changed the tactics mid-year. So, But average ratings overall. Lund hasn't played that much, but he's played well when he did play. Shishi has played well. Santos has outplayed Hansen for the most part. Everyone else kind of brings it down a little bit on that one. Chances created overall. Probably Shishi's fairly high on that one too. A 10. Hansen with a 5. So they have created more chances, these two. But not as many assists. Uh, although their assist per 90 minutes is basically the same as Swan Shishi. So there, there is that to bear in mind. Chances created per 90 minutes. Santos is out top. Uh, in fact, Shishi's much lower than them because he's played a lot more football. Uh, so I guess that kind of does make sense. Anyone who's an amazing dribbler in the midfield not really. Santos is sort of fairly similar on that one. I don't know what his dribbling is actually like. Just take a quick look here. Dribbling is eight, whereas Shishi's, I think, is slightly higher than him. Uh, no, it is also eight. Shut up, Matt. You're an idiot. Um, games one ratio. Tonya with 80. Lund, Morley. Morley's won a few more games since he's coming to the team. That's what I would say. Uh, we've actually won the least games with Shishi, but then he's played the entire year, so I don't know if we can really count that so much. Sogod has won a lot of headers. Is he tall or anything? He's six foot. Hmm. Interesting. Um, heading is seven. He's got decent jumping reach though, and that resolute personality, man, I love it. Um, anyone else? Lund, mm, Santos, and Hansen not great for the old headers. Um, 
Maybe we should do a separate one for the attacking midfielders, but like just filter it slightly differently. That's my only theory on that one. I don't know if that make much of a difference, actually. I feel like if I just turn it onto this, it'd be the same damn players. Um, actually, no. Maybe for a future season, that's what we might do. Talk about those guys separately now that we've got that position in there. And next year, we'll have a full season of having actually played those players in the correct roles. So next year, we'll do a separate set for the attacking midfielders. It'll keep the same stats, but um, just separate filters because I do want to be able to see those guys a little bit more. Headers one. Shishi wins a decent number of headers in the midfield too. Sorgard, um, wait, what? How can he have, wait, how can he have a 89% headers one ratio and yet not have won a single header per 90? Oh, because he hasn't played 90 minutes. That's why. <laughs> Key passes. That should be, yeah, Shishi's probably made the most. Um, where's Hansen? Oh, he's there. 13. Hmm. I don't know. I still think Santos... Although, if we do go after that Egyptian lad, or whoever it was, I think there might be some some uh, competition in the midfield for, for next season. Points per game. Quite an important one now. Santos, 73. Hansen, 67. Shishi's done a little bit lower, but he has played a lot of games. So, Santos is certainly coming out on top over the battle between these two for now. That's for sure. Um, as for the central midfielders, um, Kowalczyk's probably performed the best, to be honest. 0.71 per game, but then it was on the old style of tactic. Morley's certainly outperforming Tanya, so that's what I would say. Uh, passes completed. Tanya right out there with Santos. Most people doing well on that one. Kowalczyk very, very low. Strugod very, very low as well. Shishi a little bit on the low side as well, but then that's slightly different to his style of play, so uh, I don't know about that one. Points per game. We won a lot of points with Caleb Morley in the team. That's what I would say. He's clearly doing something in the team, or just getting lucky in the games that he's picked for. Shots on target. See how low Shishi is. Wow, he actually hits the target 31% of the time. That's impressive. Presumably the other 69% of the time is where he puts it straight into someone's Coca-Cola glass in the crowd. But there you go. Um, tackles one ratio. Anyone putting themselves about a little bit in that midfield? Lund, not bad. Morley, not bad. Um, Kowalczyk certainly didn't win a lot of tackles in the midfield. That's what I would say. So clearly there's something about having a Morley or a Lund or someone other than Kowalczyk or even a Tony, although he's not won a lot of tackles either. Um, I'm thinking Morley and Lund are definitely the players I want to use for that position next season, unless we sign someone better. And that Egyptian guy does interest me a little bit to try and boost that one area of the team where there's just a little bit lacking in quality. Uh, perhaps that could be the area that we could improve over the summer. Tackles per 90 minutes. We're on to... Oh, tackles per game. There you go. So Shishi, far higher than anyone else, which is weird because he's the attacking player, but he's certainly getting himself about putting him some solid tackles. Does one Shishi have good tackles as well then? Uh, six. No, he doesn't. He just seems to like them. Uh, and that's fine by me. Value. Um, wow, look at this. She, she's 450 grand he's worth. When you look at people like Caleb Morley, just nowhere near. Sergio Santos is worth a million pounds. But that's mainly due to the fact that he plays for Bayern Munich. And he will be with us again next season on loan from Bayern Munich. So I feel like he's definitely improving with us. He's still an excellent young player. He's capped out at the 19 level, but has not had any other call-ups for Portugal just yet. He looks so tired. Santos, mate, what, what's wrong? You, you look so tired, buddy. His Super League performances have been pretty poor overall. Not even a hit in a seven. In the Cup, he's been better. But again, we've played worse teams. So th there's that. And in the Europa League, he was very, very poor uh, for the most part. Although I think I played uh, Hansen a little bit more than him during that period. Personality-wise, yeah, this is the thing. Tony is lighthearted and I can't get anyone to tutor him at the moment. Lund is fairly sporting. And there's fairly ambitious, ambitious convulsion. Like the ones I really like here. Professional, professional, resolute. That's what I like. Those are the sort of personalities that I like to sign players with because it fosters a strong squad personality which can rub off on other players as it has done in the past. And I want to keep giving a chance to do that because later down the line, I want a team of older players who have all got really solid personalities so I can use them to tutor the new boys instantly. So I don't have to worry about what the personality of the new kid coming in. I'll give me a bit more free range in signing players because I'll be able to sign players regardless of their personalities and then go out and make them better, essentially. So I haven't really learned much from this midfield, really, other than Shishi is excellent and Caleb Morley has actually done a solid job in that central midfield role. But I do think that we could do with maybe signing another player for that. We've got some good players here, though. It's at least better than it was before. We've got options in these roles, depth in this area of the team. But I still think there's maybe room to sign someone that's really going to step up and take that role by the scruff of the balls. Um, Santos definitely is the best player for that attacking playmaker role. But it's great to have someone like Mateus Hansen, who is excellent cover for him and is a very good player in his own right. And it's nice to have a little bit of depth in that area of the pitch as well. Right, finally, let's move on to the strikers. And I'm kind of looking forward to this one. So we can see if there's any reason why Svenningsen has scored less goals overall. Although I think it is coming down to him not hitting the target enough with his shots, quite simply. Uh, so we're going for attackers, central, right. Um, anyone from the B team that important? Oh, 
Uh, oh, Stevie G. Bless him. Uh, okay, so we'll just um, turn on the under-19s as well. Nobody's in the under-19s at all. That gets rid of Steven Gardner and Coutinho. Stevie G is probably going to be gone next season. Anyway, might try and ship him off in the summer. I'm sorry, Stephen. You've been excellent for us, but you know. You know. Anyway. Shishi irrelevant. I wish you could remove players from this, but you can't. So bravo, Svenningson. Uh, and where's Ersan? What? I'm very confused. And oh, because bloody injured. Oh my God, I've had that turned on this entire time. I am idiot. That's why the players from loan spells haven't been appearing. That's actually quite important because we can see the minutes they've played out on loan or can we? I'm not sure if we can or not. I don't think we can, actually. I think these minutes are all minutes they play for us because Jurkovic played a lot of times earlier this season. How's he done out on loan? Uh, we'll have a look at that in a minute as well. Um, so, yeah. So we'll get rid of that for now and that's all senior squad players. So, Ersan is there. Um, it's because he wasn't available because of his broken jaw or whatever. So, team conceded per 90 minutes isn't all that relevant. Tackles per 90 minutes. Svenningson does win more tackles, that's for sure. Um, considerably more in fact he's more of a defensive forward type of player well no he's not but he can at least win the ball back for us although tackles one per 90 minutes uh or tackles per game rather he is why is that not oh yeah he's still better than bravo and ursan for that so again tackles an interesting point shots per 90 minutes he does have a lot of shots more shots than the other two and shots on target ratio it is noticeably worse like it is clearly worse than anyone else um it's about the same level of Zahidi and Yazi. And there to me is like, they're like second tier of strikers. Um, Svenningsen really does need to improve that. Now, why is that? That is actually quite interesting. Why is it so low? He's got 12 finishing compared to Ursan's 12. Isn't it? And Bravo's 16. So where does he struggle? His bravery and his aggression are a little bit on the low side, but nothing stands out to me as being contributing to him having such a, a poor shots on target percentage as relative to Bravo and Ursan. Strange. Shots on target per 90 minutes. Um, I mean, he's actually got more shots on target per 90 minutes than Ursan, But I think that's because he shoots more. Ursan seems to bide his time. And maybe that's why he's scored so many goals. He doesn't shoot as much. But when he does, he takes the time to make really good opportunities for himself. Really good chances. And he seems to put them away quite nicely. I do wonder what stat of his uh, is so good that it's causing that to be so much better than everyone else's. Uh, his strong... His strong. His strong is better than theirs. Yes, it is. Um, he does have a better first touch. Like, noticeably better than Svenningsen and Bravo. It does make me wonder if his first touch is able to him to set himself up better. I don't know. Maybe I'm trying to read too much into it. Points per game. Ursan the most. Bravo there. And Svenningsen just slightly off the pace. But you can see, he's still contributing way more than your Yazis and your Zahidis and whatnot. All that riffraff. Uh, pass is completed. Bravo 78. Ursan 78. Svenningsen, a little bit less pass completion as well, um, which is strange considering he gets a lot of assists in this team. So that's definitely something worth talking about. Key passes per 90 minutes. Svenningsen, though, 2.79. Massively more than Ursan and Bravo. He does seem to be able to pick key passes. I think it's maybe because he seems to try slightly more ambitious passes. So instead of just playing it off short, he will try those long crossfield passes. I don't know if he's got a trait, maybe, um, that enables him to do it. He actually has no traits on him whatsoever at the moment. I really thing is every time I try to offer him a new contract, he only wants to extend by six months at a time, and that's a pain in the bottom because we I really want to put him on a long term deal so we can try and tie him down a little bit more. That that's the theory anyway. Um, wow, two goals and seven hundred twenty one caps. Still only seventeen years old. Who is he wanted by then? While we're at it, let's have a little gander at Svenny. Major interest is from Borussia Dortmund. I mean, he's clearly got something about him here. Everton, Dortmund, Huddersfield, Leipzig, Schalke. Um. Lots of big Premier League size, big German size, big French size. Marseille. Um, asking price is unspecified at the moment. I mean, if they gave us 10 million, I'd maybe look at it, but I probably wouldn't. I, I don't want to sell him. I want to avoid Jonas Sellingson being sold at all costs because I genuinely think this guy is probably good enough. Look, potential cap still not even getting anywhere near that at the moment. I genuinely think, look at this, so few cons, not getting enough attention during coaching. That's on me. More convincing if he's going to take a long shot. I don't want him to. Training focus. Okay, we can sort that out ourselves genuinely i see no reason why this guy can't be an incredibly good player um the fans have a great affinity for him as well Th there seems to be no end to his talent so far as we get better his potential still says five stars and i think this guy could really go far and remember still only 17 years old that's really important he's played three seasons for us last year in the top flight he got 11 goals in 25 this year he stepped up 14 in 33 his average rating is higher more man of the matches more assists more goals 
Um, okay, he's had more games to do it, but I still think that he's been much better this year than he was last year. But next year, I really want to see him get 20 goals in the league. That's where his sort of targets lie. 20 goals in the league and 10 assists. Hopefully, I've got to give him the game time to do that, of course. So there is that aspect of things. So, key passes. Uh, we already did that one. Headers won. Um, Shishi, ooh, Svenison, 46, 40, and Ursan. So this is the thing. Our strikers are not great in the air. We don't really have any kind of outright target men anymore. And that's fine, because we tend to play the ball a lot of the time on the floor. Then again, we do seem still seem to score a decent number of headed goals, particularly um, Ursan, I find. But hey, that's just one of those things. I just seem to notice it more. We do often play those low crosses in. It's because we whip crosses, I think. That's often what causes it. Those getting into the line and squaring it to people for those tap-ins at the far post. They seem to be making a lot of difference for us. Um, Goals per 90 minutes, we already kind of know about that one. Ursan is one, bravo. And Svenningson just a little bit off the pace in that one. Games one, we've won a few less with Svenningson. Sorry, my throat's starting to really hurt now. Dribbles per game, Svenningson's massively ahead of that one. Crosses per game, they're all around about the same area. Um, Radakovic has got a lot more cross completion. That's what I would say. Um, hmm. He did all right for us this year, Rad Milia Radakovic. In the cup, he's actually been really solid for us. Um, we can't actually see his stats for the cup this year, although maybe I can. Yeah, so... In the cup this season, he made two appearances and scored five goals and got four assists. That is astonishing. Um, made six appearances for us in the league, uh, scored one goal and hasn't played well. He's got two goals on loan at Uster in the second tier of Swedish football. So, I don't know. Maybe we'll see. He'll be playing over the summer with them, but I wanted to get some of these guys out on loan to give them some game time. His performances in the cup, though, really did amaze me. Five goals and four assists in two appearances is truly astonishing. Um, but there you go. That's what we get out of the big Australian. Um... So, what else have we got left here? Dribbles per game, crosses completed, chances... Oh, that's chances created per 90 minutes. So, how are we doing on this one? Sahidi up there, Ursan, nice and high. Svenningsen also pretty high. Mariano Bravo, perhaps not as creative, but he's still got a decent number of assists this season. Average ratings overall, Ursan, Bravo, Svenningsen. That's kind of how you'd expect it to be, basically. Based on what we've seen so far, it makes sense. Assists, 10, 10, 8, not too bad at all. Assists per 90 minutes, right, interesting. Svenningsen actually has the most assists per 90 minutes. Which to me suggests if he played the same number of games as these guys, he'd probably have more assists. So that does kind of lend itself to the idea that he is more of a creative striker. He's got a decent number of goals to his game, but he's quite happy to set up his opponent. And I actually think it's very important to have a striker like that in the team. It's what Brendan O'Neill did so well for us. The reason Gardner, I think, got as many goals as he did was because he was partnered with Brendan O'Neill, getting them in from the other side, getting all those assists. That, that's what it seems like to me. And I think Svenningson is going to come into his own next season. Definitely is going to get more assists as he's hopefully we'll play more and i want to see more goals from him as well i'm not sure if ursan's going to be able to get the same number of goals this year as he did la uh, last year as he uh, next year as he did this year i think to, for him to score as many as that particularly in all competitions getting over 40 is astonishing i think he's probably just had the best season of his career and probably the best season he ever will have but that's just how it is um what about value what else have we got left so value wise look at that 5k so value wise overall obviously that's um Svenningsen. we've got um, I assume that's Mariano Bravo and that's Juan Shishi. Other Danish striker. Who's the other Danishman? Oh, it's Ursan. Bleh, of course. And then everyone else is on fairly low ratings because of that. Uh, Personality-wise, Svenningsen's ambitious nature is a bit of a problem for me, but it's kept him at the club up until now and he's already too important to the team to tutor. But, but there you go. Let's take a quick look at the players out on loan while we're here. Um, is that really all we've got left out on loan? I want to make sure that that's not the case. I think we've got more out on loan than that. Yes, we do. I don't know what that was about. Um, so, average ratings overall, out on loan. Salim Basquez is out on loan at the Vancouver Whitecaps residency. He's played 10 games for them and is playing extraordinarily well. Uh, Matthew Patton Kavanaugh is a young Cypriot right back who's gone back to America to play for North Carolina. A decent performance from him so far. He's one that I thought potentially was worth signing up um, because he's got that Cypriot nationality so we could bring him into the team maybe retrain him as a right back kind of wing back player i i don't know uh chris baker is the goalkeeper we signed from the cosmos who's immediately gone out on loan over there and it's actually putting in a really solid shift for the cosmos uh luis castillo um i swear he was playing really badly for lagodon or is there a different oh no it's atienza that's been shocking uh castillo done all right over there as well dosange doing all right over there as well five goals in four games uh sorry other way around uh, Radakovic, two goals in six games. Not too bad for him either. Josip Jurkovic is out at Viking. He's played a few games for them. Done all right. Uh, obviously, Santos is on loan to us. Kasten Yeda is out on loan at Varnamo. Doing all right, I guess, in goal. Not too bad. Roland, not doing a great job over at Viborg. Um, but, ah, it's just one of those things, isn't it? Uh, Ustogor is out at Orsund. He's not done great over there either. Oli Ikonen is over at Geffler. 
in the Swedish leagues and isn't having a good time in there either. Nicholas Vera, seven goals in 24 appearances in his performances either haven't been great. And Eric Atienza, 5.46 from 11 games. That is an astonishingly low score. 6.8, 7, 7.4. Wait, is this... I don't understand. Oh, this is a game for us. Right, okay. Obviously, he's not having a good time at La Grona's, which is weird because Castillo's having a lovely time. But there you go. One of those weird things. So, that'll bring this episode to an end right now. Um, What word should we pick for the... Hmm, I know. Let, sorry, I was watching NASCAR last night. And I've got these bloody adverts stuck in my head now. Um, So... Let's go with Ford F-150. That will be the uh, the word of the day for this video. Drop that in the comments and confuse the shit out of people. Anyway, if you have enjoyed this video, do drop a like on it to let me know to keep doing these ones because believe me, they take a long time to make and my throat is regretting it already. This is the third video I've recorded today. Um, I'm going to go not speak for five hours now. And uh, yeah, if you have enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel if this is the first video of you've, mine you've seen. For more videos on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays on a regular week, this week's a little bit different though. And I'll join you guys in the next episode for, well, first day of the season tomorrow. It's going to be a fun one. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.